Well, hello, Nativity Bible Heads. It is Dr. Wayne, and this is your Sunday morning Power Bible Study for uh, Sunday, December 27th, uh, the first Sunday after Christmas. So Christmas Day is the 25th. Uh, the 27th would be the third day of Christmas. So on the third day of Christmas. I don't know what that gift is, but... Um, uh, my gift to you is uh, not whatever, it's usually a bird, right? One of those things is a bird. Um, I've got a, a, a gift of uh, a Bible study. <laughs> How do you like that? Um, yeah, and uh, if you're watching this before uh, worship, um, um, the lectionary readings come from uh, Isaiah uh, and Galatians and uh, the Gospel of John. And I'm preaching on the Gospel of John. So um, I'm going to teach you, uh, we're going to go and look at our uh, passages in uh, Isaiah and Galatians. Now, I don't typically get to the uh, second reading much, uh, uh, typically from one of Paul's letters, but today, um, the, um, the, the Isaiah thing, uh, which is lovely, uh, starts in Isaiah chapter uh, 61, uh, verse uh, 10, and um, it goes through uh, verse uh, 62, uh, verse uh, 3. I believe that's it. Um, we've, we've been covering a lot of Isaiah. Uh, and the Galatians passage is, um, shall we say, uh, pregnant with possibility. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of good stuff in the Galatians passage. So let's get to it. <laughs> Uh, first of all, uh, if you look at our Isaiah passage in chapter 61, um, what do we know about our Isaiah that we've learned so far? Uh, and that is, it, right? Okay, in the, 60, in the chapters like 55 to 65, I think it's 65, yeah, the last 11 chapters, oh, 66, last 12 chapters, um, or is it 56 to 66? Anyway, um, we get the voice of an Isaiah what we call Isaiah the third or third Isaiah. Um, why do we call him that? Because um, Isaiah the first, the first Isaiah, uh, which is the first uh, 39 chapters, um, reflect a, uh, a northern kingdom uh, Isaiah prophesying in like the eighth century and the, the late 700 BCs. And then, um, the, uh, then we have the part of Isaiah that's uh, in the exile, which is like verse, chapters 40 to 55. And then 56 to 66, we have the part of Isaiah that's dealing with a people who are, their exile is over, and now they are trying to reestablish themselves. Now, one of the things that the early church was keen on was this. After their experience of Jesus, they started to read these uh, prophetic utterances in a whole new light. And there were things about the way Jesus was, what Jesus said, what Jesus did, and the way they started to understand Jesus that had them start to think, oh, well, maybe this fulfillment uh, that the, uh, this latter Isaiah uh, talks about, maybe it didn't get fulfilled until Jesus. Um, it was certainly not 100% fulfilled during the time of, uh, you know, before Jesus, because uh, even though they did uh, re regain the land after the exile, and they were able to rebuild Jerusalem, they were able to rebuild their temple, they were still not free. They were very much under subjection of the uh, overlords, um, um, the, the Persians who uh, allowed the, uh, Israel to uh, regain Jerusalem and to rebuild their temple, uh, had lost their, um, their uh, stature in the world. The Romans uh, took over, and so we had a whole new sheriff in town. So with regard to Jesus, he recognized, presented a fulfillment of Messiah when the Romans were in charge that had the early church take a look back and say, oh, you know what, we, maybe we had this wrong um, when we were looking for a Messiah to be a certain way. 
this Jesus uh, wasn't the kind of Messiah that we thought we needed or wanted. And they started to reconsider. And so when, they, uh, when we read these passages in uh, this Isaiah the third, chapter 61, like I said, uh, verse 10 through 62, 3, which is what it, uh, the first lesson is for the first Sunday after Christmas, we see in it a, an understanding that it's like, hmm, there's no way this really ever truly got fulfilled until Jesus came. This is, was the understanding of the early church. So let's, let's look at what they said here um, in chapters, uh, Isaiah 61, uh, verse 10. Um, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels, with her jewels. So um, their experience, the early church, their, their experience of Jesus was that, oh, he did something that we were never able to accomplish, um, being good Jews, following the law, following the, the rules of Moses and such. And Jesus, they start to see like, oh, he did it for us. The idea started to rise up and they started to get like, oh, in Jesus, God was making uh, what was 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 making up everything that we thought that we needed to do on our own. Jesus did it for us and paved a path for our salvation that didn't depend on our obedience because our obedience is always going to be lacking. So they saw in the Christ event, in the whole life and ministry and teaching of Jesus that they had been, as this scripture said in Isaiah 61, 10, clothed with the garments of salvation, covered with the robe of righteousness. There's the only way, it's the only way they could see what Christ did because nothing they did, they, they're, all of their attempts at checking all the boxes and fulfilling all the requirements was just not ever adequate. Uh, verse 11, for as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. That is their experience of Jesus. That's what they had, uh, that's, that's what they had seen in him, that, that, um, uh, that he was their true planting. Now, in verses, uh, verses one through three of, of chapter 62, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. Remember, uh, the, a lot of the language that we have in these prophetic utterances is tied to the hope in Jerusalem at the time. The early church started to see Jerusalem as a metaphorical uh, ideal and a met metaphorical uh, reality, um, and ideally. Verse two, the nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem, in the hand of your God. Isn't that lovely? Um, uh, the idea is that, uh, and, and they knew what the, the experience of the early church was, we've never been able to attain this status by just trying our darndest to be the best people we can. They realized that in Jesus, they had been given a grace gift of, oh, this fulfills everything that we weren't able to do. Now, keep that in mind now as we flip to the reading in Galatians. Now, Galatians chapter three, um, I believe uh, our lection in our, uh, for the first Sunday after Christmas starts with verse 23 of Galatians chapter three. 
Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. For Paul, when he, remember Paul was raised Jewish, not just was he raised Jewish, but he was also raised as a Pharisee, right? One of the people, he knows the law, he knows the scriptures, he knows what the scriptures demand. Paul views the, uh, in the macro view of God, that the, uh, the uh, coming of uh, the law, uh, he saw in the, as, as in, in the big picture, the law was a way of preparing. I can, you think of it in terms of, um, uh, like, uh, let's say that there's somebody in charge of making sure you go to school, okay? There's somebody who, that person is, uh, it's not your mom necessarily, but it's somebody who makes sure that you make it out of the house, that you safely traverse whatever you need to traverse to get to school, and is willing to get very tough with you if you don't actually end up going to school. That's the picture that Paul is painting when he calls the law our disciplinarian, okay? Our disciplinarian, it was that thing that would like even, even, even chastise us, okay? Uh, if we didn't get to school, if we didn't get to where the learning would be. This is the picture that he paints of the value of the Mosaic law until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. And when he's talking about faith here, the language really, I don't, it's, it's not so much the faith that we have in Christ, so much as, as, it, as the language seems to indicate the faith that Christ had. Huh? Interesting, huh? Yeah. Uh, now, before faith came, we were in prison. Now, see this thing about now before faith came? Faith, uh, I, Paul has made it clear that uh, faith has never been absent. Faith has been there from the very beginning. So he must be talking about something a little different here where he says now before faith came. I believe he's talking about the faith of Christ, the faith that Jesus had, the faith that Jesus demonstrated, the faith that Jesus uh, uh, was willing to, uh, th th that motivated him in all of his ministry to do everything that he had to do. Interesting way of thinking about it, right? Verse 24, like I said before, I'm, I'm going to read it again. Therefore, the law was our disciplinary until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. Our justification doesn't come by our faith. Our justification comes by the faith that Jesus had in that what he was doing checked all those boxes for God that actually made it possible for us to be accepted by God. Stay with me on this one. Now, verse 25. But now that faith has come, you see, again, when he talks about faith, oh, it's just now come. He's not talking about just any kind of faith. Remember, Paul talked about how faith, it's always it's been uh, our, our faith in God. There's always, we've always needed to have faith in God, especially when we look initially at um, uh, Abraham. It's like, oh yeah, it was faith all along. So this kind of faith that he's talking about that has arrived, he's talking about the faith of Christ, okay? We are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. So now that we have what Jesus had, the faith that Jesus had is the faith that we are called on to experience and express ourselves, to confess ourselves, okay? We are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. That's what the law was. Paul's idea is that the law got us to school and we fought it, okay? Jesus and his faith he fulfilled all of that. So therefore, there's no disciplinarian needed anymore because the faith that Christ had 
is now there and available for us. We can have the same faith in God as Jesus Christ had in God. And this is gonna become clearer as we, as we move along here. Uh, verse 26, for in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. And that's where our, our passage ends before we skip to uh, chapter four. But see how he turns the conversation to, for in Christ Jesus, you are all children through faith. So it's like, we are all, now the actual word is sons, uh, but uh, to inclusivize it, our, our translation uses the word, uh, you know, uh, uh, children of God, through faith. So the, the faith that Christ had is the Christ that is the faith that we have, which makes us that same, at that same level of sonship. Jesus was God's son. We are, we experience sonship too the same way by exerting, by, uh, by our expression of our faith, the same faith that Christ had, that Jesus had, that's the faith that we exhibit. Now, skip to uh, chapter four. Um, let's see. Um, I think we picked up there, I need, to, I need to double check this because I don't wanna, I don't want to get it wrong, but the first, uh, uh, the first thing he mentions here, okay, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, Okay, verse four. So we're, uh, we're skipping to Galatians uh, chapter four, verse four. So remember, we had just read uh, chapter uh, three, verse 26. All of us are, are children of God through faith. And now look at this in verse four of chapter four. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, this is one of the rarest times when Paul's writings reference the historical Jesus as far as like things, uh, historical things that happened to Jesus, things that happened, the fact that Jesus was born, the fact that he was born under the law. That's one of the reasons why we include this in our Christmas day, or our Christmas one readings, the first Sunday after Christmas, because Paul, knows of, a, of the fact that Jesus was born of a woman, born under the law, as opposed to, I don't know what, crawling out from under a rock. The idea here is that he was born just like we were born, okay? And this is, uh, 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 it, it, it may or may not, uh, Paul may or may not know of uh, Luke's story of the, uh, the nativity that we are used to, that we celebrated on, on December 25th. We're not sure, but um, uh, he, if he does know all of it, he certainly doesn't let on more than what we just see here, being born of a woman, being born under the law. And if you think about it, um, that's kind of at the heart of the story that Luke told us about Mary and Jesus being born uh, as a Jewish man, and then all of the things that happened with him, as far as uh, uh, his being uh, his being named, his being circumcised, uh, his uh, going to the temple when he was a teenager, all of that. Born of a woman, born of the law. So let's continue uh, in uh, Galatians four, uh, verse five. In order to redeem those who were under the law. Jesus, in Paul's view, came to rid those under the law, his own people, his own Jewish people, from what they had always been and what was causing them so much consternation. Remember, the law for Paul was what? A disciplinarian for them, that thing that helped them get to school, okay? In order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive uh, adoption as children. Yeah, that's the thing uh, that we, uh, that's the thought that we, uh, connects us back with uh, chapter three, verse 26, that we are, uh, for in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. So, let's say that again. 
But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, excuse me, verse five, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children, as sons. The idea that uh, as God, as Jesus was son of God, remember he just said it, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. We are now in that same status. Huh? Okay so that we might receive adoption as children. Verse six, and because you are children, sons, like Jesus was son, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, or your hearts. Uh, it was one of the uh, ancient uh, variants of that. Crying, Abba, Father. The word Abba is a, a, an Aramaic word meaning uh, like daddy. Uh, one of those sweet uh, like things that you say that, that you call your dad um, that's uh, not necessarily his name or something formal like father, father. No, but like daddy or you know like or as they would say in Texas, my daddy. <laughs> or I don't know like Paw, papa or something, whatever, you know, people have these names for that are like a, an endearing thing. And it comes from a very um, young place in our heart. Young being, uh, you know, something before we have the full gift of speech, Abba. Abba is an is a Aramaic word and you can get that it's like, oh, that definitely sounds kind of like the babbling of a baby, does it not? Yeah, it does. Well, it's that thing that means father or daddy. Uh, that endearing kind of thing, dada. Maybe it's more like dada, okay? Because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So we have in us, because of the faith of Christ, because of the faith that we have uh, in Christ and the faith that we have in God, based on the way Christ trusted God, we uh, now have that same spirit, okay? God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. So we have the same relationship with God as Jesus did. This is what Paul is saying. Verse seven, so you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. Wow. You are no longer a slave. Remember, uh, at, at, the, at the beginning, we, uh, the, uh, the law was something that was, uh, we were imprisoned, and it was a disciplinarian to get us somewhere, right? It didn't work. It didn't work. We fought against it. We fought the law, and the law won. Well, the law then gets obliterated, or fulfilled, if you will, with what Jesus does. So that means that we are no longer a slave, but a child. So slave means uh, we don't have any rights. But as a child, we have the rights as an heir has rights. So we have been made that by God. It's as though uh, we've been adopted and fully legally, uh, you know, everything that uh, is, is rightfully ours. And this gives us the right to be bold as those children of God, those sons of God, sons and daughters of God that are actively, actively uh, being his presence in the world. And if we're conscious of this, if we're totally alive and conscious of this, that changes how people experience us. This is our destiny, this is our heritage. This is the, one of the mysteries, quite frankly, of the whole incarnation. This is one of the bedrock um, values we have uh, in the Episcopal tradition, uh, coming from the, the Anglican tradition of theology, which is the, 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 the incarnation made such a dent, such an impact on who we get to be as human beings that uh, that there's no way, there's no way to deny it and to, to totally let it in. We, we don't really totally know how to let it all in, but that's the work, is it not? This is what we work on. 
getting who we are as heirs, not as slaves, as sons and daughters. We are those to God. We are that, those, that, that's our divinity. And if that's the case, then that makes our presence in the world something exciting, something vivid, something alive, that, um, uh, that uh, if, if we were to totally grasp um, boy, would we say, see a whole transformation of society? But it doesn't happen, though. Um, we end up, uh, we end up poo-pooing ourselves and saying, "Oh, I'm just, I'm just blah 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 blah." And then it doesn't, uh, and then we don't fully step into our true inheritance. This is the invitation of the incarnation. This is the invitation of Christmas. Is that not only have we welcomed God being born into the world? We also welcome ourselves being uh, reborn as those heirs that represent God in the world. And that is our lesson for this, the first Sunday after Christmas in 2020. Um, so uh, thank you for joining me and uh, do uh, continue having a blessed Christmas tide. There's nine more days. Uh, 25th, 26th, 27th. So yeah, that's just, just the third day of Christmas. So we've got nine more days of Christmas. Don't stop saying Merry Christmas. Don't stop saying Merry Christmas until when? That's right, January 6th, because that's when Epiphany begins. Christmas goes through January 5, okay? Merry Christmas all the way through, all the way through <laughs> January 5th, okay? Let's properly honor the birth of our Lord and also honor what is being born in us as heirs of this Christ in God. Amen.